Greetings everyone, I'm Mar. Once again, this is my opinion, as you can tell from the title up there. This is my review of the latest entry in the Halloween series in the last one that uh, is going to be produced under the current arrangement. It, of course, is Halloween Ends. Now, for those of you who haven't been watching the videos, I am going to delve a little bit into my history of the Halloween series. But before that, just a reminder... If you want to support the channel, both the Patreon and PayPal links are down below. You want to continuously support the channel, go the Patreon route. You'll gain access to videos early, and you'll also be able to suggest topics for future videos. You just want to do a one-off, go the PayPal route. Either way, your support is appreciated. This film was once again directed by David Gordon Green, who directed the last two ones. Of course, he's also directed other films, Your Highness, Joe... The Sitter, and he's going to be doing an untitled Exorcist film after this, which is like, oh great, do we really need another one? There's a series that doesn't need as many sequels as it does as that one, but that's another day, another video. Now, this film has gotten mixed reviews from critics, but that kind of sums up every film in this series <laughs> after uh, the first one. Well, mixed to negative. I mean, I can't really think of any of the Halloween films that really got mostly positive from the critics. From fans, yeah, critics, it's one of those weird ones. And it seems to be mixed amongst fans, too. In a lot of film groups I'm in on Facebook, there are people like it, people hate it. And I know at least one of my critic friends doesn't like it. Uh, two of my co-workers at work, they like the film, but then they hated a little bit of the ending, which, having watched it, I can get. Now, my personal thing with the Halloween series is this is one of those series that I watched in increments, but unlike, say, Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street, where I saw the films completely out of order, I mostly saw the films out of order. Because the first entry I saw, as I've said many times, was Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. New film when it came out, so hey, that's the one I saw. Then I went back and started watching them in order. One, two, then I saw four and five, because I knew they had Michael in it. Uh, H2O had come out by this point, so I saw that one. And then somewhere in there, I went back and watched Halloween 3, which, if you haven't seen my videos on that, that's one I hated at first, but then liked. Uh, I saw Halloween Resurrection when it hit uh, pay-per-view. Uh, I mean, I like it okay. It's definitely one that has aged a lot for me, but I could still get some stupid enjoyment out of it. Uh, the Rob Zombie films, I didn't see Halloween 07 in theaters, but I did see his Halloween 2 in theaters with Jeff. I mean, I don't know if it's up on the channel right now, but there is video that me I took before the movie of him and me. Uh, I got a review of 07 up on here if you guys want to see my thoughts on that. I like it okay for what it is. Halloween 2 I haven't seen in its entirety since its theatrical runs, even though the DVD is somewhere over there. Halloween 2018... I liked OK. It's essentially a greatest hits repackaging of a lot of the best moments from the past films, but in color. To steal a line from James Rove. Those of you don't know, that that's just that's a little jab at what this film is essentially trying to do. It's trying to do to the Halloween films what Evil of Frankenstein and the Hammer Mummy were for the Universal films of both of their names. Doesn't work as well, but I think that's more because of some of the side interviews. And a lot of the times it's like, we just saw this not that long ago. And then Halloween Kills comes along. That one seems to have a little bit more mixed, but I remember enjoying Kills more than 2018, at least uh, with the first watch. I haven't watched both of them in their entirety since, but I could say I do plan one of these days just for completionist's sake to get all three of these films, probably once the box set hits, and then watch all three in a row and see what my thoughts are on them. But at press time, I like Kills more than 18. Now this one, it's definitely not your stereotypical slasher film. I mean, there are moments where you can definitely see the slasher elements there, specifically more towards the latter half of the film. When it opens up, there is a little bit of it in the cold open. But the middle part of it feels more like it's a psychological horror with a little bit of slasher DNA. And I think in order to talk about that, i got to explain the plot. Now the plot starts one year on Halloween after the previous two films because the last two films were the first since one and two that actually took place on the same night. 
entirely. Now, one year, you know, people are starting to do the old, oh, the boogeyman, he's out there, he escaped, ooh, that type of crap. Now, we meet our one of our main characters, Corey Cunningham, nice little use of the last name there. He's a 21-year-old at this time, and he's babysitting a young boy. Now, back when the original film was set, some people would be like, oh, male babysitting, that's not relative. And they do do a little bit of humor with that here, but not that much, thankfully, because it's like... That's a stupid stereotype, like, oh, the male's babysitting, you know what that means, what he's going to try. No, tell me. Tell me. What's he going to try there? What's he going to try? You sure that's not your own pre-Christian bias there? Night scenes be going on. We get a nice little wink and wink tribute to John Carpenter's use of the original thing in his film with the nice use of John Carpenter's thing here. Although, when you think about it, that's one of those things like, wait a minute. Are they trying to say John Carpenter exists in the Halloween universe? Again, it's one of those weird little tribute things of like, wait a minute, why are they watching Scream 2 in uh, Halloween H2O? Wait a minute. Wait a tick. One of those weird things is like, just don't dwell on it too much. You'll start going cross-eyed and your brain will start going in circles with it. Just accept that the film does exist, at least in this universe. Now, eventually the kid starts messing with Corey, locks him in the top room the attic, which is up a long pile of stairs, which when I saw this, the one thing I have to mention about this is who in Haddonfield could afford to live in a house like that? It's like when they redesigned the Myers house for Halloween 5. It's weird. Uh, but I guess at this point they can't afford to live a bit more lavishly like that, at least this couple. So, uh, just go with it. At least that's what I did after thinking about it for a second. Like, uh, probably just a one-off. If every house was like that, then yeah, I'd start to get worried. Now, Corey eventually kicks the door open, but as he does, the momentum carries him forward, and he kicks Jeremy over the banister all the way down to the ground level just as his parents are coming in. And they're like, ah, freaking out, because they just saw their kid get yeeted down the stairs and land on it. Now, this is a little bit of dark humor, but what makes this work from a drama perspective, at least for me, is the fact that this whole scene has been set up. You think, okay, is Michael going to show up and it's going to be his first kill? Is Michael going to kill the kid and frame Corey? What's going to happen? And then we see this. It's like, ah, well, it's the kid's own dumbass fault for doing that. I mean, there's the type of pranks you do and type of pranks you don't. And as, when he started kicking, when your parents got home, you probably should have unlocked the door. So it's his own dumbass fault he got killed. But at the same time, you could say that uh, Corey was watching him, so it's his fault for getting locked in there back and forth, which is why in the film they clear that he was not charged with murder. He was cleared of it, and it was just manslaughter. I'd say involuntary, and based on what's going on, I don't see why anybody would charge him in the first place. But that's just probably me thinking with an active brain, looking at this. You know, there's a lot of times where we let emotions get in control of our logic, as a wise fictional ape once said. And three years pass... We see that Hanfield is still reeling from the effects of Michael Myers, you know, as we've seen in previous films and in other horror films, mainly because he vanished. Uh, Lori is writing a memoir. She's living in a new house with Allison, so she is trying to put the past behind her. You definitely see she does feel a lot better than she was in the last one where she was letting the ghost of Michael linger over her. She still wonders at times where he is, but she's not letting that get to her. We see the character of Corey. He's still haunted by the actions that happened in the cold open. And he's working at his stepfather's salvage yard. And we can see he gets bullied a lot. And there's one scene that when I saw it, I'm like, oh yeah, this is definitely a tribute to Stephen King's It, where they jump him and they throw him over the side of a bridge down to a ravine. Now, during one of them, before that, Lori brings him to where Allison works because he gets injured during the thing. And they get into a little talk. And Corey and Allison hit it off and they go to a Halloween party. And, of course, who happens to be at that party, which is held at uh, Lindsay's bar? The mother of the kid that Corey accidentally killed. Which, seeing her go off on him, I'm like, I'm like, I get it, your pain and all that, but it's like, there's no reason to go after him in public like that for this. If you mean if he cold-bloodedly killed your kid and he got off on the technicality, Freddy Krueger style, I get it. But the way that it's shown in film, no. But at the same time, you can understand her pain. And that is when he leaves and gets attacked by the boys. Now, he wakes up randomly in the sewers and he finds that that's where Michael Myers is. Which, I'm going to bring this out right now. This is why there's a lot of memes floating around about this film because of all the weird stuff in it like this. 
because we find out that the whole time Michael's been living in a sewer down by the river. <laughs> uh, yeah, that one's never going to get old. Now, the weird thing is, is that Michael doesn't kill him. The homeless guy who, who he talks to tells him that everybody that Michael takes in there, he kills. For some reason, he doesn't kill Corey. I mean, he does this weird thing where he looks into his eyes, which is why there's a lot of speculation from the groups, like, oh, does this mean he's passing it on? That's jumping a little ahead of myself, but... As the film goes on, based on everything that's happened and his little conversation with Michael, and how his relationship with Allison seems to be going a little weird... Now, it's fine with him and Allison, it's just that Lori starts to get suspicious a bunch. Which, given her Michael senses and they're probably tinging, you can understand. Now, Corey starts killing some people. The main one is when he goes and kills the doctor and the other nurse at the place that Allison works at. And that's because that's when Michael also shows up, which leads to a meme idea I'm going to do, but I'm not going to spoil it here. Now, here is where this little idea of the new killer and Michael does work. This scene right here. Because it's almost like, okay, that's what you do, let me... Let Papa Michael show you how it's done. Recreates the type of murder of how he killed Bob in the first film. A nice little one. Plus, Corey has his own type of mask. I mean, it's one of those cheapo scarecrow masks that you get. Kind of, uh, you know, made from the same material that Michael's clown mask in 07 was made of. But here, I do like it. It becomes a little eh when he actually goes in, beats the crap out of Michael, and takes Michael's mask. Now there, it's one of those things like, you understand it, I get it, but at the same time, it's like, Rrr. because on one hand, Michael has apparently been in there for a while. It seems he's weakened it a little bit from his prime. And remember, this is not full-on supernatural Michael a la Halloween 4 through 6, where he can basically do Jason Voorhees levels of feats of strength. He still has, like, normal strength levels. He can just exert more because he is semi-superhuman. You know, he can survive like a battle axe to the chest somehow. Here, I mean, we've seen him survive some injuries, especially in the last film, which leads to another thing I'll get off in a second. But with that, you can see him getting overpowered. Now, as I mentioned, it is a little weird because the last film, we saw him survive a lot. He got beat up, he got shot so much, and then he still got up. Now, there's the whole thing that maybe since that all happened at once, he survived it, but he was reeling from it, which is why he had to go recover for a couple years. And even then, due to his age, not eating well, or as well as he should, while he's alive, would you call this living? It's just one of those things that kind of seems like a little bit of a disconnect between the two films. But since they're portraying a more human-esque supernatural Michael, the best way I can compare it is if we could, it's like... It's like when you it's like when you look at the Friday the Thirteenth films and you compare part six on onwards, Jason, where he's zombified fully and he has all that supernatural strength and all that. When you compare him to parts three, it's gonna be two through four, Jason, where he is kind of zombified. He can survive certain things, but he'll still be reeling from. It. It's not like he can get back up right away from a lot of the stuff. It depends on it. Like the hanging, he still had to recover for a second and then pull his, himself out of the noose. And then like the big old injuries, he has to recover for a little bit, knocked out, but then still gets back up. Whereas Zombie Jason would probably get back up. It's like that, where he can still recover, but it just takes a while because he's not like fully 100% supernatural. And even then, when you factor in Thor and J Thorn Michael is probably a limit to what he can recover. <laughs> like, if he blew him up, I don't think he'd be coming back together. <laughs> but who knows? It would have might have surprised us. Now, Corey, a lot, half all the people he kills is to try to stay with Allison. And even though their relationship does start off as cute and you do like seeing them together, I mean, from what we've seen with him, Corey does deserve a happy ending. And what Allison's gone through the last couple films. Losing her mother, losing her father, all the crap around town. You definitely see she needs a happy ending. And don't go there, you dirty boys. That's not the type I meant. She deserves to, you know, live happily ever after. But it, it's a dark happily ever after because Corey starts becoming obsessed with her. And as the film was going on, I'm like, how is this going to go? Is Corey going to end up killing Lori? He tries, but it doesn't work. Which, of course, leads to the final confrontation between Michael and Lori in this continuity with a fight in her house. And the lead-up to it 
it involves a touchy subject that I'm not going to get here, but let's just say within the context of the film, I thought it worked. The final fight between Laurie and Michael is the highlight of the third act. And it's one of those ones where you're watching like, ooh, that's a little brutal. And then how she kills him is like, really? That's how it happened? Doesn't have the same badassery as when she cut off his head in H2O. It doesn't have that same finality of like when he got put into the burning house in the 2018 film, which the next film quickly found a way to salvage that being his final death. But you get it. It works because of what happens. And then to make it final, to show the town that they need not fear this boogeyman as they've been seen in the film, what they do next, I have to applaud. I don't. I haven't really had in-depth conversations with the coworkers, so I don't know if this is the part they really don't like as much. But I mean, this is a minor spoiler, so if you haven't seen the film, you might want to cut off now. But then again, if you're this far into it with me talking about some sm other spoilers, you probably don't care. But anyway, they take him out and they put him through an industrial shredder and shred his body, basically make Michael Myers hamburger meat, and they do it in front of the whole town. So now everybody knows for certain that Michael is dead. Perfect way for everybody to see that and to move on and heal. And of course, this is after Corey has been killed as well. And the ending does have a fitting thing. Lori decides to stay in the town and she's moving on, possibly getting in a relationship with Officer Hopkins, which there's some cute moments between them early on, which was a nice dichotomy between... Corey and Allison when they're having their happy moments, seeing that Lori could possibly have a happy moment of her own. And Allison's going to move out. They have reconciled, but she's got to move because she's got to leave Henfield. And, of course, Lori finishes her memoirs. Now, if you are disappointed in the lack of Michael Myers' action other than the end of the second act and then into the third act, I definitely understand. But I can't say I hate the film for its psychological nature that... Uh, into the first act and into the second act carries because I like that. I mean, I mentioned my complaints about, you know, Corey taking the mask, but I do like that middle act nature. But I could definitely understand why fans who are watching were disappointed with that, which is why I do like that one meme that kind of points out how, probably accidentally, this new trilogy kind of follows the same path as the. of the first three films the Carpenter was involved with. I mean,. I mean, not it's not note for note. I mean, you got the first film called Halloween, takes place on Halloween night, ends with him getting killed in a way to like, what the? Of course, it's different. Shot versus being set on fire. Next film takes place on the same night, continues the same night. Lori's incapacitated in the hospital. They're all trying to find her. Excuse me, try to find Michael. And, of course, it ends in a way to where like, okay, he should be gone. Or should be. The only difference is one, he looks like he's dead. The other one, he just vanishes into the night. And then the third one is not what people were expecting. You know, an anthology, f a film that could have started Halloween as an anthology series. Psychological horror with some slasher elements. And then, of course, you even go down to that. They use the Halloween 3 font for this film in the credits. So there's that. Now, I'm not saying this film is going to end up being a cult classic or even a years later love classically h3 was but it's one thing i have to point out because <laughs> you know people have raised that point already now uh, i don't know if i would say this is my favorite of these new ones but uh, who knows it might end up being down the road when i watch all three in a row again so like i can appreciate it for being different but it's probably not what a majority of halloween fans wanted uh, well the ones that wanted a third film just to end it probably wanted a more typical slasher film but the dark love story, the psychological horror aspects, they kind of touch a little bit on what exactly makes this type of murder. Is it more nature, more nurture? I do like how it touches on that in there. Here it seems to be a little bit more of the nurture or at least the grand environment around him because he's already grown by the time this happens. But of course we see his home life. It's not as over the top as... Uh, Michaels in the 07 film and we see how the people in town treat him after the incident so that combined with the weird little thing with Michael which they never really explain all that is Michael like transferring his powers or something and then takes them back later 
It's a weird little thing. The way I look at it is that he looks into those eyes and he sees something very familiar about those eyes. Like to steal a line from 07 Loomis. These eyes can deceive you. The absence of light. These are the eyes of a psychopath. That he probably sees that type of nature in those eyes and that's why he decides not to kill him. Of course you could also go with the other interpretation as well. Nothing wrong with it. But this film doesn't really, well, this series isn't really fully 100% set in stone that it's a supernatural evil and not just like a personal evil. They never really mention it, but if you want to go with it, that it's there, but very, very subdued to the background, you could also go with that little discussion that that is what Michael's doing in that scene and then takes it back later. Now the film's 111 minutes, so a little bit shy of two hours, and I didn't really feel the length a lot. There was like a couple little minor moments I did, but in a good way. And the film was made for $33 million, which nowadays and how inflation's gone and all that, that's like mid-tier budget. That's about the same cost that the Nightmare remake was about a decade ago, so still made for about the same budget. And so far it's made $85 million, so even by Hollywood accounting it has made its money, so it'll probably make about around $100 million before things all said and done, especially when you counter factor in home video. Now, not really much else to say about this film. Uh, does it get my recommendation? I'd say just for curiosity's sake, if you're a fan of the series and you're not at the point where like I refuse to watch any of the further ones, if you did like 18 and or kills, either way, I'd say definitely watch it just to end it. Just go into it knowing that it is a little different than other Halloween sequels. Until next time, guys.